Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm having an experience that I didn't think I was ever going to be lucky enough to have. I'm taking out an incredible Humber Hawk Mark V. Now do you know what, it's a rare thing to be taking out because although I think there are around 14,000 of them made, there's only three roadworthy examples on the roads of Great Britain today. So being able to track one down and track one down looking as lovely as this one, which is called Priscilla, is quite a privilege and I'm looking forward to showing it to you today. Now if you've never watched one of these videos before I thought I'd explain what we're going to talk through. So first of all we're going to have a look around the outside, have a look inside under the bonnet and we're going to show you that engine, show you inside the boot as well because that was one of the key selling features and then we're going to get up close and personal, talk through the dash so you can see what's going on and how everything works and then I'm going to take you out on a test drive. Now this feels like quite a step up from the Morris Minor that I'm usually knocking about in so uh, yeah quite a good fun day out so let's have a look at Priscilla. The first thing you see when you pick up the brochure for the Humber Hawk Mark V is the Royal Warrant front and top centre of the brochure because it's always worth mentioning on a Humber video that the cars were popular not only with royals the Queen Mother had a Humber but with statesmen and politicians Winston Churchill also had a Humber, so the name Humber really stood for something. And in short, Humber was a name you could trust and it came with heritage and distinction without being over the top and slightly vulgar like many luxe expensive brands of the 21st century. The car was available as a saloon as we've got today and a touring limousine, probably one for the more well-heeled client. And there was a price difference on these and the price, including purchase tax for the saloon at the time of launch in 1952, was £1,129, 5 shillings and 7 pence. The price for the limo, if you were that way inclined, was £1,261 and 10 shillings. Again, that price included purchase tax. The, the Hawk Mark V was a car which wasn't designed to win races, but to win over those who wanted a comfortable, luxurious, roomy driving experience. The car was said to offer light, responsive controls, synchromatic fingertip gear change, which I would argue isn't quite right, it is a little bit more than fingertip, and precision steering, which I would say is almost bang on the money because even now that steering holds up very well compared to many 50s vehicles. Now it was said in the brochure it was a car which was docile in traffic and fast on the open road. And with this car being introduced before the advent of motorways at the end of the 1950s, a driver didn't need to be racing along at high speeds for long periods of time in the same way that we do today. So with the top speed quoted by Popular Classics in 1991 as 73 miles per hour, it was more than sufficient for roads of the time. It also makes it keen enough to keep on today's roads, especially with so many places now limited to 50 miles per hour or clogged up with traffic. A great example is, well, you'll see it on today's test. The gearbox, which I'll show you later on on test as well, is a four speed column change. It's got control ring synchro on second, third and fourth gear, which essentially means you've got no synchro on first gear. So you need to be using that for when you come to complete standstill and when you pull away. That's really the best practice with that. There's also a safety catch on the reverse gear, which ensures it's not selected in error because that can cause real problems, especially at high speed. And not just for the reason of going backwards, but also damage to the box itself. The brakes, as I mentioned later, are drums all round. The system chosen by Humber was a Lockheed two leading shoe system with hydraulic operation. They're nine inch drums on these and the handbrake is the umbrella style, as you might have been expecting because of that bench seat. One of the more bold claims within the sales brochure for these is the suspension. Humber promised smooth, stable travel under all road conditions. A selling point when many roads across the world where they were selling into in different countries weren't majority tarmacked. So things like good decent suspension really meant something. But also it means something today in the UK because dodging potholes could basically be classed as a modern sport. Now if you're wondering what the suspension is on this, it's to the front, independent with silico manganese coil springs, and to the rear, it's long semi-elliptic springs. The steel and rubber bushes were said to eliminate many greasing points, and the torsion bar was supposed to eliminate sway, which to be fair, it does. They weren't wrong. 
Interestingly, Humber also stated they considered vehicle safety. So if you look at some of the brochures for the late 50s, they really upsell this. And something which wasn't maybe a keen first thought as it might be today in the early 50s, really was for Humber with this vehicle. And as part of this, the vehicle's chassis is a rigid and fully boxed girder frame with cruciform cross members. This was chosen by Humber because they wanted a car which could withstand the stresses and strains of rapid acceleration and braking, but also stand up to the most difficult and arduous road and track testing. And when you go out on one of these, even today, it's really obvious that they got it right. It can be quite hard to judge in a video how big some of these cars are. So with this one, it's 108.5 inches long, which translates as 4,585 millimetres and the width on this is 70 inches which is 1,778 millimetres. The unladen weight, so that's without any passengers or luggage, is 2,919 pounds or 1,324 kilos. The colours available were beach green with light fawn, metallic quartz blue with light fawn, black with red which is what we've got here, gun with red and satin bronze with red. Now this is a very brief overview on the Humber Hawk Mark V. Just like many Roots cars, it didn't run for long before being upgraded. And after coming to market in September 1952, it was replaced with the Hawk Mark VI in June 1954. Gosh, I am really into this Humber Hawk. It's such a brilliant little car. And for me, it's you read the brochures and you come out and you see the car and it's whether it matches up to the hype or not. And I was looking at the brochure for this and it said, praised for its beauty and praised for its economy. But what does that really mean? Well, in today's money, this is doing around 22 miles per gallon, which when you look at it on the market, a lot of your modern SUVs and some of your smaller cars seem to be doing around that 30, mid 30s mark. So when you look at it, actually, it's not that bad. We haven't moved on enormously in terms of fuel economy. And with this, you get a bit more character. In terms of its beauty, well, beauty is subjective, isn't it? But for me, I think this is such an attractively designed car. A lot of cars you get into from the 70s and 80s, you feel like they've dated really badly or the fabrics haven't held up very well, the trim. This not so and that is because in my opinion it's a humber and humber built cars to last but this was a car that was built in a different era because bear in mind as you came through your 40s and into your 50s when you ordered a car in great britain you'd have to go on a bit of a waiting list and wait and because i think it was 90 percent or quite a high percentage of cars had to be exported as per government agreements with manufacturers so having a car was something special in a way that I just don't think that we can fully anticipate today because if you wanted a car and you had some money you could go down to a forecourt and get it back then you would choose it you would pour over your brochures so buying a car was special people bought stuff and they kept it to last and they looked after it now if you're wondering how everything's held up well first of all it's got to be mentioned the seats have been recovered and something that I do like about this and you know how I feel about recovered seats I like a bit of originality is that these seats have been recovered in leather quite often people will try and save a bit of money and they'll go after a cheaper option in vinyl and if you're wondering what it should have looked like this is a very easy inroad into talking through the dash because when I open the glove box I noticed that it still had the original leather trim so that's what it should have looked like um, and I like the fact that they haven't deviated too much from what it would have looked like brand new. Now coming into the centre here, everything is deliciously simple. Over on the left hand side here, you've got your water temperature gauge and you've got a light for the ignition and over on the right hand side, you've got a fuel gauge. And by the way, it's a 10 gallon tank or 46 litres if you're that way inclined and you've also got your oil pressure light there as well and in the centre, you've got this speedo. Now we talk about the beauty of this car. Now I want to show you something on this. Can you see this shroud that sits over the top of the speedo? The reason for that is, is Humber designed it so that if you had sunlight coming in, your speedo was shielded slightly so that you could still see those numbers and you could still see where everything was. Now for me, 
that is such a thoughtful little design that they didn't have to put in, but they have put in for driver comfort or pleasure. And this is what I talk about when I talk about how Roots made cars that were exceptional in a class of their own. Now coming down from that, you've got your choke, you've got your windscreen wipers. Over on the right hand side here, you've got your push start because to get this to start, you have to turn the key and then push the push start. So if you're a little bit younger like me, you might not recognise that. And then over on the right hand side, you've got your panel light. We've talked about this a lot in older cars, you can turn the panel lights off and on. The theory behind that is, is that if you're driving at night, the panel lights might dazzle you or distract you. But I don't think I've ever seen a set of lights that are bright enough to distract or dazzle me. Coming down from there, you've got this nice little cubby hole to put your bits and pieces in. In this car, it's sunglasses. An ashtray. Now, Humber must have really had quite a collection of heavy smokers in their, uh, in their customer base because we've got an ashtray in the back as well. So I guess if you're children feel like having a little ciggy as you drive along, they're covered too. Although, why you would smoke in a car like this, I do not know, it's beautiful. Coming down from there, you have got your heater. Now this is worth mentioning that this was an optional extra, it has been put into this, so that's nice, because uh, they are jolly cold if you don't have that put in. And you could have also had a stereo put in as well, but whoever the original owner was, hasn't picked that option. I think what else have we got coming over on the right hand side? You've got the B button. I was like, what's that do? What does that do? And then I realised it was for the bonnet. So I was like, surely it's not for the boot. And then you've got a couple of aftermarket switches there. And that is pretty much everything you've got. Again, talking about the thoughtfulness of design, you've also got these really enormous door pockets, which are great for things like gloves, or I guess if you're one of the smokers, you could put all your smoking paraphernalia in there. It's just such a glorious design. Again, you've got an armrest, which you will have seen when we've been looking around. You've got armrests on the doors. Driving this car is lovely. Even the seats have been designed to have a certain way to them so that your back is supported fully when you're driving to lessen the stress. I mean, it's just wonderful, isn't it? One last thing I should mention is you've also got your lights in the centre there, so you've got, we've got it on off at the moment, but you've got side and headlights there as well. Now, I think it's high time that we started her up so you can have a listen. Now, the engine in this is the 2267cc, giving us 58 brake horsepower. Check we're in neutral there. Don't you think that sounds just so lovely? Now she is running slightly rich, which you'll probably pick up when we film from the back. But there's one last thing that I didn't show you, and you know that I love them in a car. We have a little clock up here. Now the great thing about a lot of these Humbers is they pop them up here. So whether you're the driver or the passenger, you can see that clock. Unlike that Rover that we tested a while ago, where it's all the way over there, and it just felt a bit, just didn't feel right. Having it up here, it feels perfectly natural. Right, we have no seat belts today because of the age of the vehicle, so don't panic, I'm not forgetting to buckle up. I'm going to get a twirled round. We have got column change on this, no synchro on first. Um, and it's, again, it's that Berman recirculated steering on this as we had in that Scepter. So, let's go. <laughs> drive has been absolutely bonkers it's been like catalogue verres we've had the man who stepped in front of us to take a picture of the car and remember we're on drum brakes all the way around in this car um, and so I thought gosh you're putting a lot of faith here in both me and the drum brakes but thankfully we weren't going too fast and we were able to stop and second of all every time we try and show you the drive from first gear into fourth we either come across a giant traffic queue, somebody cutting in front of us. To say it's a Sunday afternoon, the traffic should be a lot calmer than this. So hopefully, whilst we're out and about today, I'll be able to show you that column change. Because a lot of people fear column change, and you don't need to. It's really not that hard. Once you get your head into it, and you 
perfect the technique. It's just as simple as the floor change that you're probably more accustomed to in your modern car. So where does this car sell it for me? Well, number one is the driving experience. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, your seating position, you're seated very well within the car. You've got this, I think it was called, um, just like a curved screen. I don't think it had a particularly special name, but the idea of curved glass was still quite a novel thing. People were still getting quite excited about it. We talked about it in the Jowett video. It was quite a new thing when they bought the ja uh, I think it was the Javelin was the first car that had the curved glass. So it was still, by this point, in the early mid-50s, quite a novel thing not to just have a flat plane put in because it gives you more visibility when reversing, when driving. So again, you get that added little boost of confidence whilst you're driving. And second of all, we have to talk about these seats because they are so comfortable and luxurious that I wish that my sofa at home, my brand new 70s sofa, was just as comfortable. This is quite the delight. Now in terms of where I think that it could maybe have a few little enhancements, and bear in mind I'm talking about a car from 1953, and sometimes people say to me, oh Steph, you know, that's not as good as my car from 2022. But here's the thing, what technology is as good from 1953 it's in 2023 if we were still running on the same technology there just wouldn't be any progress with there. so look i know it's not as good as a modern car but that's not what we're here to compare it to we're looking at other cars from the era so first of all when you're at low speeds it can be quite heavy turning but again if you've been in older cars that notion won't be unfamiliar to you um, I've been round to the Morris Minor quite a lot lately, so it feels a lot heavier to me than if I've been out in some of the other bigger stuff. Um, what else would I change? It's so hard when you're trying to pick something, you're like, oh, what would I change? Um, that heavy steering for me, I prefer a floor change, but if we did have the floor change, we would have to sacrifice this beautiful seating. And this is one of the things that was sold on, actually, is the seating, not only for the comfort, but the space. Now, if you ever look at Morris Minor brochure, the people that they drew inside the brochure aren't full-size people when you do it to scale, so it makes it look a lot bigger inside. Now, when I looked at the brochure pictures for this, I always take brochure pictures that have been drawn with a pinch of salt from this era, and I thought, yeah, maybe it'll be a good-sized four-seater car. Not so. I could, I'm not the smallest, uh, <laughs> I'm not the smallest person in the world and I could fit three of me in the front comfortably and in the back and if we were to change over to floor change we would lose that space in the front so I think it's just a case of getting your head around that column change but very small criticism indeed. Other than that there's really not that much that I would change. It's a superb little car, it drives very well, as you can see the suspension mean and we talked about that suspension when we were walking around but when you see it in action you see that the potholed roads of Great Britain are matched well with this suspension it just takes it all in its stride whereas you get a lot of modern stuff and it doesn't always absorb all the stuff coming through as you see in this another great thing about this and I've not been able to drive it at any great speed on this particular film bit of test is that the noise inside the cabin is so much quieter than some of the other stuff from the 50s. There's no wind rustling in through the doors or around the windows. It's just a very well-built car. And you know what? To say that it can hold its own, even now, shows just how impressive it must have been at the time. And that's the beauty of Humber cars. Now, it's a very small little test drive from me today because Unfortunately, the roads are very clogged, so I'm not able to get right out and get the wind beneath her wings and really put some gusto into it, which is quite a shame because this is a beautiful car. I feel enormously privileged to have taken her out today because she is such a rare beast, she's such a beautiful example, and she's so lovingly well cared for with such low mileage. So thank you very much to the young couple that own her and thank you very much to the club as well because I've heard that they are very supportive indeed. So if you are buying one of these or you are buying a Humber, do check out the relevant clubs because I always hear this about Roots clubs. They are very supportive, friendly people which always makes ownership 
a much easier pill to swallow. So that's it from me today. I hope you've enjoyed this very rare car. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget, if you haven't tuned in yet, we do have a new series on iDriver Classic called Rust Recovery, which is where we're taking Tina and the Marina from a rusty wreck to, well, if it looked like this, I would be very chuffed indeed. So that's it from me today. I'm waffling on, so take care and drive safely. Thank <laughs> you.